Not long after this, John, Shrek, Robin, and Allison all leave the pub together. Before they get into John's car, Shrek asks about how the day Lula died, John said that he heard Tony come into the Evith's house, but that he actually didn't see his uncle. This line of thinking gives John pause. He thought that it couldn't have been anybody else but Tony since Tony had a key, and that he'd assumed Lula had been talking with her uncle. An awful lot of assumptions going on here. Except that how remarkable could this other person have been if Lula didn't mention it to John? Hello and welcome to Procontation Points Video Snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books, discuss what went wrong, and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read-through of The Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith. Now the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. This book contains harsh scenes that some people might find upsetting. Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 40 as Strike mentioned to Robin, he was going to get his interview with Freddy one way or another. He runs a car and drives out to where the studio is and basically pushes his way past several levels of security. Once in the office, Freddy is obviously floored that this complete stranger would have gotten all the way to his office. Obviously, he calls for security, but stops when Strike brings up Tansy. Encouraged by Freddy's lack of response, Strike brings up that he basically has blackmail on Freddy, that he'll go to the police and the press with this info. Freddy then sends his minions out, the book's words, not mine, and tells Strike that he has five minutes. Strike then says that the photo the press unwittingly snapped is of a woman sitting on the Baguzzi's balcony. Strike then explains that Freddy likely found his wife's sash or caught her in the act of using. As punishment, he forced her outside in the cold in her underwear, and that obviously Tansy hadn't wanted to be photographed by the press who were too busy waiting for Lula or Mac to show up, so she hid behind the shrubs. Following this, when Lula fell to her death, Tansy obviously started banging and screaming on the door. After that, she ran downstairs to tell Wilson about this, but what Freddy did next was to hide any evidence that he'd been abusing his wife. After removing her fingerprints from the exterior of the flat, he then went to fetch her, where he convinced her to lie about where she was when she saw the little fall. But when the police did show up, Freddy's soul was inconvincent that Tansy would be able to pull herself together and stick to their story, so that's why he made such a fuss about the destroyed flowers. What's more is that Shrek knows that all of this had been weighing heavily on Tansy. She She's been through so much, willingly letting the press drag her through the mud simply to cover up not her drug problem, but the fact that her husband is abusive. Freddy hesitates for a moment before insisting that the curtains are drawn and that Tansy isn't going to change her story now. But Shrek seems to think that the pressure about what she overheard, plus the public sympathy that will come out for a woman who suffered domestic abuse, would be much greater than literally any amount of money. As you can imagine, Freddy doesn't exactly take too kindly to any of this and tells Shrek to get out. But Shrek offers up the, his ace, that if Freddy doesn't confess to his domestic abuse, he'll be, instead be on trial for murder. That even if the police don't find Freddy had anything to do with that, that he'll be liable for accessory after the fact. Shrek seems to believe that Freddy helped the actual killer to get away. Shrek then asks if Freddy is ready for some questions, and then asks about the movie he wanted to have Lula and Mac be in, then asks about the biopic about Lula. Freddy gleefully tells him that Tony Landry had promised the rights to Lula's story as soon as Yvette dies. Nice guy. But then Strike brings up Tansy's relationship with Tony, which is that he's representing her in their own divorce. But Freddy laughs about the entire thing and spills a bit of tea, that he'd hired a PI because he thought that Tansy was cheating on him. But as it turns out, Tansy is simply covering for Ursula's own affair. Ursula is cheating on her lawyer husband with Tony Landry. The two lawyers are business partners, so Freddy is practically giddy at the thought of watching that play out. Before he goes, Shrek asks Freddy if he heard any noises while inside the building. Freddy admits that he heard footsteps on the stairs but thought that it was Wilson, except that this doesn't make any sense. The timeline is this. Tansy saw Lula fall to her death, pounded on the door to be let back inside, and ran downstairs to Wilson. Freddy took a moment to wipe down the balcony of evidence before going downstairs to fetch his wife. Wilson then went up to the third floor to try and find the killer, but a moment after he'd gone up, so too did the Bagootsies. Immediately after getting into their flat, Freddy heard footsteps where there shouldn't have been any. This is obviously quite baffling to Freddy, since even by his own admission, it probably couldn't have been Wilson. Shrek thanks Freddy for his time and tells him that he knows Freddy is probably eager to call his lawyer right now. Chapter 41 Wardo calls back the next day to report about his conversation with Mac about his clothes from Same, that he'd been given a custom hoodie, cufflinks, a hat, and a belt. Strike seems to think that it's important that there weren't any gloves. Before he hangs up, Wardle mentions the investigation in Rachel's death. However, Strike isn't all that interested under the idea that it wouldn't really change things. He asks when the funeral is, but Wardle only wants to know why Strike cares so much about her. Um, because she was a person who didn't deserve to be murdered? 
John later calls up to tell Strike the details of the funeral. John also feels guilty over Rochelle's death, if only because he should have helped her out more. After hanging up, Strike asks Robin to come to the funeral with him and to do a mysterious something for him. I'm sure that it'll be quite a lot relevant and that it'll reveal the actual killer. It apparently involves the weirdo who's been sending Strike death threats, although he doesn't have anything to do with this case, according to Strike. We jump ahead to the funeral, which is held at a strictly non-denominational funeral home. Strike thinks about how sad that the entire thing is, especially because the minister can't get the Pearl girl's name correct and keeps calling her Roselle. How tacky. Even worse is that almost nobody showed up and nobody seems willing to talk about how terrible Rochelle's life had been. On the walk over to the nearby pub following the service, Rochelle's aunt Winifred hangs on to John and won't stop talking to him. Shrek tries to engage in a conversation with Rochelle's psychiatrist who keeps insisting on doctor-patient confidentiality. Shrek then goes to sit next to Allison who is upset that Don ditched an important client meeting to come here, that Tony is angry over the entire thing since he had to do the meeting by himself. It's not like John knew Rochelle. However, upon examining why both of them are there, Allison admits that Tony asked her to come keep an eye on John. Shrek then asks about her relationship with John, that the two head lawyers at the firm, Tony and Cyprian, are her actual bosses. She doesn't work with John at all. He asks how a romance blossomed between the two of them despite not working on the same floor. She said that they've only been together for a few months right after Lula died. John was a mess. However, the way that Allison says it... He came upstairs to see Tony. Tony was busy, so John came to wait in my office. He started talking about his sister, and he got emotional. I gave him tissues, and he ended up asking me out to dinner. Ah, yes. So romantic. To the point that even Strike wonders what the hell she's even playing at. He then questions if Tony really let his secretary date his nephew, but all of this is a ruse to bring up how Tony has been sleeping with his business partner's wife. That the reason why Ellison went to the conference at Oxford was at the behest of Cyprin to try and catch Tony and Ursula in the act. And obviously, Strike brings up how odd it was that Tony went back to London without telling anybody to visit his sick sister. Tell me, says Strike, would you rather think that Tony was in bed with Ursula May all day or having some kind of confrontation with his niece? However, then Allison confesses this, that Ursula is a gold digger and that Tony has less than Cyprin, so there's no way that the Ursula-Tony thing is going on. However, when pressed about how sometimes passion in a good-looking man can make a woman forget all about it, Allison gets really angry and insists that Lula jumped of her own free will. But when Shrek presses about how Allison never actually met Lula, she insists that Tony told her all about his niece, which I'm sure was nothing but filled with glowing love. So excuse me if I said that Allison is in no position to talk about what actually happened to Lula since her only source hated the girl. Not long after this, John, Shrek, Robin, and Allison all leave the pub together. Before they get into John's car, Shrek asks about how the day Lula died, John said that he heard Tony come into the Evet's house, but that he actually didn't see his uncle. This line of thinking gives John pause. He, he thought that it couldn't have been anybody else but Tony since Tony had a key, and that he'd assumed Lula had been talking with her uncle. An awful lot of assumptions going on here. Except that how remarkable could this other person have been if Lulu didn't mention it to John? Shrek then asks about the spare keys to Yvette's place. John thinks that they're all present and accounted for, but isn't certain. And then he goes over the timeline of what John did and when he heard Tony come in. Before asking if Yvette confirmed that she'd seen her brother, John agrees that he thinks that his mom did confirm that she'd talked to Tony, but she was also coming off from surgery and was groggy and in pain. Strike then says that he's worried John and Yvette are in danger, but that he wants to talk to Yvette first. John agrees, but says that he needs to be there thanks to his mom's poor health. Chapter 42 The next morning, Strike goes out to where Yvette lives, only to get an urgent message from Robin. John has been delayed and doesn't want Strike talking to Yvette alone. He then turns around to text John how long he thinks that he's going to be. Strike's friend from Germany then rings back with some info about Aggieman. However, the person that Strike's contact gives him is most assuredly not the professor who died five years ago, but a 20-year-old in the Royal Engineers. By the time that's finished, John messes back saying that he won't be able to do it today. Strike is then like, fuck this, please forgive me, John, and goes up to ring the bell anyway. Yvette's nurse lets him in and Strike lies to say that John is on his way. Upstairs, Yvette is exactly like how you'd expect somebody on death's doorstep to look like. Strike wonders how medicated that she is. She also asks Trice about where John is, as if she'd forgotten the first time she'd asked, which I feel kind of works out in Strike's favor here. 
Strike starts up by asking her what she knew about where Lula had come from. She's of the opinion that her late husband must have known, but that she wanted to delude herself into thinking that Lula was hers and had only ever belonged to her. He then asks about Lula's search for her bio family. However, as previously mentioned, this was at the same time she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so she was more focused on that and Tony's anger with how spoiled that Lula was. However, Yvette also says that she doesn't know the details of what Lula found, only hearing that Lula's bio mom was exactly as what Yvette had pictured this entire time. She had no info on if Lula found her bio dad or not. Strike asked her about what she and Lula discussed right before she died. Yvette says that she'd been groggy in the aftermath of her surgery, but that Lula wanted to talk about Charlie and his death. This conversation is clearly painful to Yvette since she's now lost two children. Strike helps her to take some volume. But then Yvette starts to talk about that day and of Charlie in general. But since then, I've come to think that perhaps I've deserved all of it, said Lady Burr so distantly, her eyes fixed on the ceiling. I've wondered whether I'm being punished because I loved them too much. I spoiled them. I couldn't say no. Charlie, Alec, and Lula. I think it must be punishment because otherwise it would be too unspeakably cruel, wouldn't it? To make me go through it again and again and again. She then talks about how cruel that Tony had been in blaming Yvette for Charlie's death and Alec banning him from the house. Shrike asks if Yvette told all of this to Lula, but Yvette seems kind of out of it. Maybe she is, or maybe she's simply trying to hide something. She randomly says that Evan looks a lot like Charlie. And that leads her off into a tangent of what her dear Charlie could have possibly ended up if he'd lived. The entire thing is kind of strange, and it kind of got me wondering. Put a pin in this, maybe. Strike asks if she remembers Tony coming over that day, but she says no. But she was also drugged up thanks to her surgery, so maybe he had. After she rambles on about her brother and John and Lula and Charlie and her cancer for a while, John excuses himself to the bathroom. But instead, he goes into the closet where he finds a bunch of Somme handbags. There, exactly as Sierra had explained to him earlier, the lining comes out. And in one of the bags, he finds the blue paper. This is put into an evidence bag unread. He then acts like he walked into the wrong room by accident since the nurse had come into the room. In the bathroom, he takes a good look at the paper, which is exactly as he had predicted. It was her will, as witnessed by Rochelle. Outside, Yvette had fallen asleep, so Strike says that he'll take his leave. He asks like he'd forgotten something in the sitting room where he'd been waiting for Yvette to be made ready and hangs up the phone he'd taken off the hook. Before he leaves, he randomly confirms that Yvette ha has a bad Valium addiction, which the nurse obviously knows all about, but that doesn't matter much when a woman is at death's door. However, as he's trying to leave, he randomly slips and falls, which is even worse because of his false leg. After leaving the house, he calls Rob and Wardle in the law offices of Landry, May, and Patterson. Thanks for listening to my book snark on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help us well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. Newly added to Patreon is to become a member without paying. You'll get access to the same things on Tumblr, but on Patreon. Also new is a one-week free Patreon trial, so be sure to check that out. Special thanks to Don, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well. Just $10 per chapter. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of spicy short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!